Uh, first of all, uh, thanks Sean and Johannes for giving me the opportunity of presenting something here. And also, also want to thank, even if uh, only virtually, uh, Robert Brentner, because this is actually the result of uh, um, a class that I had with him in the last semester about mathematical treatments of philosophical phenomenology. And uh, yeah. So let's get started. First of all, I want to give an outline of what I will tell you about. Um, I want to specify very clearly in which sense I have a model. Because there is, uh, in science in general, but especially in Corsian science, I feel like there is a bit of confusion uh, when, the, the, when we talk about models. And I want to pin it down from uh, the perspective of philosophy of science. Uh, then I will specify first, uh, I will explain uh, what I will model, and uh, this is basically a Husserlian, a Husserlian view of how we perceive things. And then um, uh, I want to explain also, motivate really briefly, uh, why category theory at all, and then spell out the models, and then actually um, uh, uh, make explicit what I want that you take home after this presentation. In fact, uh, I want to make it uh, uh, explicit already now because the model will be really hand wavy. Also, the mathematics, uh, um, I will sacrifice rigor uh, in order to uh, convey uh, the mathemat mathematical intu intuition behind it, and also because of time constraints. And also because I think uh, um, that uh, the necessary requirements for understanding what I will say uh, are just understanding what a category is, a functor, and a natural transformation. And the take home messages are that. Course the science should focus a bit more, at least, on time and the relation between uh, conscious experience and time. Um, and then we could, that we could use uh, higher category theory and uh, quantitative category theory in Christian science, and that is actually also really intuitive. And um, yeah. Um, so the usual notion of modeling in uh, conscious science is uh, a model of consciousness is commonly defined as a theoretical description that relates physical properties of the brain two phenomenal properties of consciousness. Um, uh, this is a definition from uh, two Wikipedias online, uh, but it's not what we are after. We are going to model just subjective experience, just the qualia structure, just the phenomenal properties of what um, uh, we experience. And our model, in a, in a nutshell, um, is, uh, to be very precise, a representational model. Um, there are various kinds of models in philosophy sci in science, and ours is representational. It's a toy model and a categorical model. But what does this mean? A representational model is an item that represents something else. For example, a miniature replica of the Titanic, uh, out of plastic, out of wood, whatever, um, or the Bohr model of the hydrogen atom. atom. Uh, it's a toy model, and toy models are strongly idealized and extremely simple, but still refer um, to a target phenomenon. They do not uh, offer accurate representations, do not explain, and do not provide predictions. Toy models serve another goal, namely providing understanding. An example is the Lotka Volterra model in population ecology. It basically models the relation between a predator species and a prey species, uh, or a deizing model in statistical mechanics that is used to uh, talk about uh, mag magnetism. Um, and it's categorical. Um, a categorical model is a particular type of a mathematical model. A mathematical model is a model where the uh, item is um, a mathematical um, item, construction, whatever, that uses category theory. Uh, probably the most famous example is quantum information theory or quantum computation a la Abramsky and Koch. Um, but what I will talk about? I will talk about temporally extended um, conscious acts. What are these things? Uh, this is a big mouthful. Um, but basically, when I'm hearing a melody, or when I'm in the forest and I'm um, feeling the breeze of the wind, or when I see a horse running, uh, when I perceive some motion, um, do I really just perceive some snapshot of a, uh, or a, the conscious experience of just some snapshot in a chain, discrete ones in a chain? Uh, there are some, um, there are some uh, arguments. Uh, for example, this paradox of temporal awareness, it's also called uh, paradox of subjective synthesis sometimes, um, that um, this should, shouldn't be the case, because if we, um, if we are directly uh, aware only of the present moment, only of what is happening in this instant, in, in this instant and the present moment is instantaneous, thus um, we cannot be um, uh, 
aware of temporally extended phenomena like hearing a melody or uh, perceiving motion, at least not in an obvious sense. And um, what I mean, at least I have the intuition that sometimes some phenomena are in some, in some sense continuous, not just snapshots. And Husserl provided, um, a, I think, nice solution um, explaining how this happens. If we um, have primal impressions, and in this diagram they are the PIs, um, and these uh, P primal impressions are abstract idealizations that actually for him do not occur in nature, but this is another, um, uh, another uh, way, uh, another thing that I won't, do not want to discuss, but like, uh, these are like the so-called snapshots that we could uh, intuitively think about. Um, but we do not ha only have that. We have like, we are in some sense aware of what just happened, and we are projecting into the future what will happen. And not in a high cognitive function, functioning way, but just in a very primitive way, like uh, uh, also birds uh, hearing the sing, uh, the sound of other birds, um, are in, to cognize something temporarily extended, uh, uh, for Husserl, they should have this structure. And these um, awareness of what just happens are called retentions, and these are the um, air, R, or arrows in this diagram that go back in time. Uh, and the, uh, our projecting um, um, in the future are called protensions. And these are the P arrows um, <coughs> that uh, we will project what will happen. Like, uh, and this also like, explains uh, how uh, we are surprised or some um, conscious phenomena that we hear when we hear music um, in, uh, of, of some kind. Um, why category theory? Uh, because um, phenomenology um, wants to say the structure of something, and the structure is um, uh, of, of our conscious subjective experience. Um, here we have a quote of a famous phenom uh, Husserlian phenomenologist, uh, Alan Gurvich. Um, the very first task of phenomenology is the disclosure of the essential nature of consciousness and mental life. Or as Husserl likewise says, it's idos. But where is the structure here? Nowhere to be found, more or less. Um, an idol is actually defined as an invariant structure of conscious experience. And these invariant structures of conscious experience, of uh, different aspects of our conscious experience, are what we are, uh, what I am uh, aiming at now with this uh, model. And uh, why category theory? Probably uh, you are already massively convinced, but I really like this concise quote by a paper of a Wadi about structuralism in philosophy of mathematics. And, from Dedekind through Nertel uh, and the work of Heil Eilenberg and Maclean, the fact has clearly emerged that mathematical structure is determined by a system of objects and their mappings, rather than by any specific features of mathematical objects viewed in isolation. Um, and now I will start slowly to spell out um, uh, uh, my model and actually what um, in, in, what, in what sense uh, my, uh, the items of uh, the category and the constructions I'm talking about um, refer to, to, to some things. And in, my, um, in the model, every mathematical item in, um, refers to mental objects. I mean, um, uh, pure qualities like redness uh, or, or the shape of something, but also perceived objects, uh, emotions, uh, everything. Um, a temporally extended act is modeled by a um, category of uh, darker symmetric um, multi-categories, of course I'm going to explain what they are. Um, primal impressions are modeled by darker symmetric multi-categories and pretensions are, and retentions are modeled by weighted um, one cells in the category of darker symmetric multi-categories. Of course, I mean, probably now you think, oh, this is crazy, I mean, um, uh, there is uh, no time to explain uh, everything, but I will try to give some uh, intuition. Um, a multi-category is some way of generalizing the notion of category uh, in which we don't have just um, uh, in the domain of our arrows, we don't have just um, um, one object, but we can have uh, many more. Um, and um, and uh, um, and so, sorry, um, we can diagrammatically represent them um, uh, in s some uh, process uh, theoretic diagrams as, for example, something 
like this. We have many objects in the codomain of some process, some morphism. <coughs> Sorry. But just one object in the codomain. And um, this object will model um, intentionality in the Husserlian sense. Um, in, uh, what is the Husserlian sense of intentionality? Um, is uh, some kind of directed aboutness uh, of uh, some perceptual object. Um, the, the elements in the codomain, in the domain of uh, um, multi-morphisms or multi-arrows or arrows, these kind of arrows, um, are um, called uh, hyletic data. Basically, it could be, for example, um, the shape of some um, object or um, an emotion that uh, I have or um, and anything that you can uh, ascribe as um, some kind of uh, property of some kind of um, perceptual object. And what's in the uh, codomain will be a perceptual noema in uh, a Husserlian technical jargon. What is this perceptual noema? Uh, perceptual noema is basically a way of saying oh, we have this object of, in our conscious experience but in phenomenology we just care about analyzing our subjective experience. We don't care about the ontology out there, uh, even if it's an, a hallucination or not, we don't care. That doesn't mean that uh, phenomenologists uh, are convinced by hallucinations, it just means uh, they have a so-called coherent theory of truth. Um, how my experience coheres with the past experience, then I can uh, infer uh, what's actually true and what not. Um, and so, yeah, the, this, this perceptual object could be um, uh, this table, this whole, um, uh, this, this whole room, um, uh, sadness, really anything. It's really a bit hand wavy, I, I, I understand. But now I also want to justify, because like, I think Johannes made an incredibly good point in his presentation, uh, we must explain, like, for example, why is it composable? Why is it uh, transitive? Because, in fact, multi-categories um, are composable. And I think the easiest way to see how we could do that is just, um, uh, just, just um, picture this diagram. We have some... A process that takes a, a, a lot of objects and directs them into one, and then um, uh, some other objects um, that um, that are the are in the codomain of these processes that are um, synthesized uh, that are um, uh, mapped to um, a final object, and this is equivalent to a morphism that composes all these uh, parallel uh, morphism in a reasonable way. Um, why could this um, make uh, any sense? Um, for example, I could, we could, uh, one, uh, one, one, and also one thing, uh, I'm going not to specify the technicalities, but we are also working in a symmetric multi-category. This means that I can swap these, um, uh, the thing in the, the, uh, the element, the objects in the domain, however I want. Um, um, the, um, for example, if, if this object is, let's say, a particular kind of redness, uh, a, per uh, a perceptual object, uh, uh, an object of conscious experience, and in my, um, in my living I associate with this particular um, kind of redness uh, aggressivity or um, uh, uh, um, some kind um, like a remembrance of being, uh, um, of, uh, being uh, uh, little, uh, these kind of things, these could all be characteristic that we intentionally impose on this kind of redness. This kind of redness then could also be um, imposed on some other perceptual uh, noema, uh, some kind of other object of our conscious experience. Um, let's say blood. I see blood. Uh, I, uh, I see uh, uh, someone bleeding and. Uh, and, uh, um, and, it, and I impose on the, this perceptual object exactly uh, this, this bleeding. Uh, so when I see, when, uh, when, when I uh, have this perceptual uh, noema in my conscious experience, 
all the characteristics that I associate on the other perceptual object of my conscious experience that are imposed on the uh, ultimate noema or uh, this one that we're interested in are also imposed on this because when I perceive this uh, blood I also perceive uh, all, the, all the characteristics that uh, I, in my subjective experience, um, related to this kind of redness. And uh, therefore it is uh, composable and, uh, tr tr and uh, transitivity uh, makes sense. Uh, what about, for example, um, uh, um, in identity errors, in a multi-category, um, every object has a... a Every object has an identity error. Uh, why? Um, I, 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 my, my explanation for this could be um, just that if like, I have this perception of redness, um, then redness impo like, is in some kind of a reflective sense um, the same kind of redness. So it imposes on itself some, in some kind of sense um, uh, the particular, the same characteristics uh, of of the, that particular object, um, but in phenomenology, phenomenology, we do not have only intentionality, on, not only actively imposing uh, characteristics on perceptual objects. We also have passive, um, some kind of some kind of notion of passivity, and um, the uh, how, how, uh, um, and this notion of passivity is uh, sometimes called uh, um, uh, the sensible faculty, um, like uh, um, passively collecting data from the world. Uh, but in, and they, and also like Husserl has some um, uh, fragments where he actually states that they are dif difficult to um, uh, separate. And in our um, uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, my, uh, in my model, I took inspiration, in, I have not seen it this uh, formally defined, uh, I'm sure it's doable and I will do it uh, in um, a new version of this presentation or in a draft. Um, but are, uh, are, um, uh, are definable uh, dagger multi-categories. Basically, uh, a dagger category, but um, uh, that a dagger category is basically just uh, a uh, category that sends morphisms it in, uh, inverts the arrow in in some sensible sense in some sensible way uh, preserving identity composition and it's involutive so if i um, if i apply the dagger two times it's the same as f um, I'm pretty sure it's doable, but there is a problem. We are not anymore in the um, um, uh, in multi categories um, because multi categories also form a category uh, because we have uh, some uh, notion of uh, homomorphism between uh, multi categories, uh, some kind of functor between multi categories, and this functor is uh, unital and associative, and so it forms um, a category. Um, but we are not anymore in this category because. If we invert the, the morphisms that we had until now, it, the, this kind of morphism, now we have an object that maps things to many objects. Now, the codomain, in, the codomain, in the domain there is only one object, but in the codomain there are many objects. This is not a multi-category. A multi-category has many objects just in the domain. Um, so we are now in basically a, a subcategory of the polycategories. Polycategories are further generalizations of multi-categories where both the domain and the codomain have many objects. Um, so basically these dagger symmetric uh, um, multi uh, um, this category of dagger symmetric, so in the sense that we can swap, and dagger that we can uh, dual uh, that we can dualize this morphism. Uh, um, uh, is a subcategory of these polycategories. Um, and why passivity? Because what, what was before, what we imposed, the hyletic, hyletic data that we imposed on the objects, now are the data that we collect passively when we experience something. And so this duality between passivity and activity is modeled by this dagger factor in our uh, category. But the crucial, the glue of phenomenal experience for phenomenology is um, 
uh, time at the exam. Ah, I forgot. Sorry. Um, no, uh, um, like uh, uh, this uh, introduction to multicategory is basically the Mickey Mouse version of uh, um, some chapters in uh, Leinster um, higher operands, higher categories. So credits all to him, all to him, and. Now, um, I'm going to introduce weighted categories uh, that I discovered thanks to a beautiful uh, video of the Topos Institute called uh, The Rise of Quantitative Category Theory, where Paul Perrone gives a beautiful introduction uh, to uh, quantitative category theory, and I highly recommend it for someone that does not want this uh, Mickey Mouse hand, uh, way, uh, hand wavy reduction of uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, and uh, these uh, weighted categories. Uh, are, are the way that we can um, instill um, uh, some quantitative reasoning uh, in categories. And this is exactly what Kobe was, men was mentioning before when he said to now. But now, I'm, this seems to me like uh, uh, more of a metric space, not really a category. Uh, what, what, what are you actually aiming at? In fact, weighted categories are so intuitive that they are already present in consciousness science. And we had an example with uh, nouns, um, spaces uh, of, um, no, with uh, qualia structures. Because he defined some kind of distance that he mapped between qualia structures. And this is so intuitive that uh, it was already in, um, uh, basically reinvented, for example, by Villani in uh, optimal transport theory. Um, uh, but, okay, no, I, um, this, does, this doesn't interest anyone. But um, with, with, with this kind of um, quantitative category theory, then we can do what we do actually in uh, graph theory. If we are in Königsberg, and we have some ways of um, crossing uh, bridges. We want to say that going from here to here is way better than going from here to here to here to here. Um, and how do we do that? Uh, we do this with, uh, weighted with weighted categories that will allow me to um, will allow me to um, instill some kind of metric space, uh, really loosely speaking, in uh, uh, our category. Uh, basically, we have some kind of cost function uh, between uh, the arrows in our category. And the arrows that I'm talking about now are actually um, 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 a step above. They are the arrows between primal impressions. Um, these primal impressions, a primal impression is modeled by one category of uh, multi uh, categories, these strange things. Um, and another primary expression is modeled in this sense. I want to, I want to say that, like in the diagram that I showed you before, um, we um, have some kind of mapping um, uh, that, um, that, that functions a bit of a, like a metric space. Um, to quantify things, to uh, give some uh, notion of uh, time passing. And uh, so we have a lot of primal impressions here, where you have passivity, objectivity, no, passivity and activity, uh, with these dagger strange uh, multi-categories, that are pushed into um, other primal impressions, like in the diagram that I showed you of uh, Husserl. And uh, with this we want some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of cost function of how much does it cost, for example, to go from here to here, and from here to, I don't know, some other category, and from uh, here to here. And this is done with um, weighted categories. I realize that I do not have a lot of time, right? Yeah, yeah you one minute, and then you're in question. Okay, so there is a way of instilling, <laughs> there is a way of instilling um, probability theory in uh, um, our uh, in our um, categories, and uh, there is a way of systematic defining really uh, um, of systematic defining um, uh, things in the future, and this will be non-dualized non morphisms in these uh, um, weighted categories, and uh, things that go in the past retentions will be dualized morphisms in this uh, notion of symmetric weighted category. Um, and we could quantify the, the time intervals uh, with this uh, um, um, optimization function that takes the infimum um, of uh, go uh, of like the, the pathways. Um, uh, 
This is the, my big cool diagram, so I didn't have to typeset, but imagine like really many, many, many conscious objects in a primal impression. Many, many conscious objects in a primal impression, and then some pro protensions, retentions, protensions, retentions, and then also, if we have uh, the time, natural transformations between protensions and retentions, uh, uh, between protensions and protensions, retentions and retentions, or um, a mix, uh, they will be like updates of uh, ah, I, I, I expect something, but then I understand something else, and so I transfer, for example, my expectations. So yeah, uh, what I want to, what I wanted to, um, uh, to, yeah, to <laughs> just communicate today. Probably my model is just a poetic analogy, not really uh, meaningful, not a lot of predictions, just uh, rationally reconstructing uh, introspectively our subjective conscious experience. But I'm convinced that the relation of experience to time is fundamental and is. In the, in the 1890s, William James, Principles of Psychology, said it, but also today the most theories of consciousness do not analyze it. And that reasoning with quantitative, the, uh, quantitative category theory, because, um, for example, now already did it, and we, have, um, we need to um, uh, have some kind of uh, metrics between uh, categories, like in, in graphs. And uh, higher, because conscious experience is so complex, so many. Uh, so many things happening, so we need to, um, I think, yeah, elongate our ladder of categories so to um, stratify our um, understanding of conscious experience. Thank you, sorry for having me. I think the endeavor is very essential, not necessarily with category theory, but the general perspective on modeling phenomena, it's um, this constitutive broader and kind of user inspired sense of the term. So, uh, have you thought using this sort of uh, formalism or conceptual framework about how you could uh, account for uh, you know, this central problem in consciousness, which is the so called pre reflective self consciousness? Meaning that consciousness genuinely comes about as, con as conscious of itself, yeah. without any higher order sort of reflexive, reflective, uh, uh, reflexive uh, principle. Yeah. Um, yes, I have thought about it. I think um, I have two answers. One is honest, and one is not. <laughs> the honest is I think uh, it doesn't. Uh, I can capture it. The uh, not honest one is saying. Okay, I mean, I, I have this notion of um, conscious acts as morphisms in these categories. Um, so, um, if, like, also categories come with uh, identity functors on themselves, um, then these, like, uh, if I have a category, then I also have an identity factor. If I have an identity factor, I have something that realizes that it's conscious of itself, but could seem reflectively, so, no, in the end, I don't know. I thought about this answer, but yes, I thought about it. But well, that's the most difficult problem. Yeah. <laughs> that's the most difficult problem. Yeah. Um, just want to ask about the relationship to maybe this math theory that Andre Erismar presented, because I think there is some notion of time in their theories, right? Yes, yes. Um, in fact, I was uh, extremely happy. Uh, I've never heard someone um, talking about pretend, pretend, okay, I mean, I don't have a big career in uh, um, <laughs> consciousness science, but I've never heard someone talking about pretensions and retentions. And she mentioned it in her presentation. The, 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 like, she formalized pretensions and retentions. Uh, I didn't have the time to, to, to take a look into it, but uh, yes, I think uh, this is a perfect intuition. Uh, she, she actually did. Like tried to model, or maybe like modeled successfully, um, pretensions and retentions as well. So totally, uh, exact uh, intuition. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm not totally sure why you need multi categories and poly categories, not just the kind of yeah, Great question. I don't need them. Yeah, great question. I don't need them. Actually, I could have done the same thing with the small uh, monoidal categories, but um, I feel like maybe it's an unorthodox, an unorthodox position that multi categories are actually a bit more easier to explain if you don't, uh, if you're not aware of monoidal categories, because to phrase these in monoidal categories, then you have ah uh, tensor product, uh, blah blah blah, of a lot of things. Then uh, 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 you wouldn't need to go say, oh, but then I need poly categories. Ah, uh, yes, but I mean, um, I don't know. Like it's a problem. 
I mean, yeah, I was going to say the same thing. So if yeah. you, once you want the dagger as well, right, then you want multiple ins and multiple outs. Yeah, like, we can talk about polycategories, and monoidal category is like a representable polycategory in yeah. that sense. And yeah. They're, yeah. They're kind of equivalent, but they're quite well known. So just talking about a dagger monoidal category and just doing the diagrams is quite easy for some people. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, maybe it was um, just uh, I want to do higher category theory, look how cool I am. <laughs> but uh, um, no, I mean, I had just the information. In fact, like what you said, um, it also saves me for uh, a bit of this. Ah, uh, look, I have faith in me. There is a way of uh, saying the, the dagger in, in multi categories. I could have just said there are monodal categories. There is a dagger monodal category. Full stop, not having to. Ah, you will wait, I have a draft. Blah, blah, blah. But yeah, yeah, there are. Okay. There are. Oh, okay, can I read that on? I have the arm. Great, Yeah, yeah, there are. Okay. Um, let's have a figure again. Yeah. Thank you.